Hi, this is Bart Polson, and this video is a lecture for Psychology 1100 Lifespan Development. In this video, we're going to be looking at the first part of Chapter 2, which is called Beginnings. In the, this first video, we're going to look at genetic influences on development, so things like chromosomes, genes, and mitosis, and meiosis, uh, genetic disorders, and testing, and so on. The first thing we want to do is we want to talk about the effects of heredity uh, on development. And what you have here in front of you are uh, chromosomes. And chromosomes are these rod-shaped structures that are inside the cells. The typical human cell contains 46 chromosomes and 23 pairs. And so you see them numbered here from 1 to 22 with a little box around the 23rd pair. And the 23rd pair is the one that shows the sex of the child. So here on the left we have uh, the 23rd pair has two X's, that's uh, going to be female, and the one on the right has an X and a Y. The Y is a tiny little one, and that's going to be uh, a male. So genes, these are biochemical materials. They uh, regulate the development of a number of traits. Some traits, like, for instance, like blood type, um, may be associated with just a single pair of genes, one from each parent. Others, on the other hand, are polygenic, and that means that they use several pairs of genes, uh, often a huge number. As such, it isn't really meaningful to always ask about what's the gene for this or what's the gene for that, as most characteristics are the result of many genes. Uh, it may be the case, though, that a gene is part of an, a chain and that if that gene isn't functioning, then the entire chain doesn't work. And that way, you can't. it does make sense to talk about a gene playing a role in a particular attribute or function. Anyhow, we'll talk about some of the ways that uh, genes and uh, inheritance work in a moment. So we want to look at um, the uh, DNA. This right here, the, the genes are just the segments of strands of that's deoxyribonucleic acid. That's the DNA. And DNA takes the form of a double spiral or double helix, like a twisting ladder, as you see right here. Um, by the way, the shape matters because it influences the kind of interactions between um, the chemicals. And so the rungs of the ladder that are going across here consist of one of two pairs of bases, either adenine and thymine, uh, usually just abbreviated A and T, or cytosine and guanine, that's C and G. Um, by the way, if you ever saw the movie Gattaca, it had a lot to do with genes. The word Gattaca is spelled all with the uh, A, T, C, and G. Anyhow, uh, the sequence of the rungs in the genetic code, uh, that's what causes the developing organism to grow, you know, say, for instance, arms or wings, if it's going to be a bird or skin or scales. It's what makes the difference between different biological organisms. So now we want to look at um, meiosis and mitosis. Now, there's two types of cell division. Uh, there's mitosis and meiosis. In mitosis, the strands of DNA break apart or unzip, and that's what you see happening here in B. And then what happens is the double helix is able to duplicate. The DNA forms two camps. It, it goes one on either side of the cell, because this is one cell, so it all splits apart, and then the cell divides. And then each incomplete rung of the ladder, so each half then combines with its appropriate partners, so the G and the C combine, the A and the D combine, and it forms a new complete ladder, uh, and then the two resulting identical copies of DNA strand um, become members of this new cell. As a result, the genetic code is identical in the new cells, although what can happen is that cells can mutate, and that's where the, the copying is not exact. So, for instance, uh, radiation can lead to uh, mutation during this process. Uh, there are other environmental influences. They can also occur by chance. That's not very often. Um, but it does introduce some variation in the genetic code, uh, the way that works. All right, now let's talk about identical and fraternal twins. Here we got two Japanese girls giving us their gang signs. And identical twins are formed when one zygote, sort of one fertilized egg, breaks into two cells uh, that separate, and each of them develops into an individual, and so they have this same genetic makeup. They're known as monozygotic, or MZ twins, because they came from a single zygote. So, on the other hand, if a woman releases two ova, two eggs, in the same month, and they're each fertilized by different sperm cells, then they develop into fraternal twins, also called dizygotic, or DZ twins. Um, this actually happens a lot with fertility treatments, because you can have several uh, fertilized eggs at once, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a later chapter. 
Now let's take a look at uh, dominant and recessive traits. So traits are determined by pairs of genes, sometimes a single uh, pair, uh, sometimes many pairs. And each member of a pair of genes is termed an allele. That's A-L-L-E-L-E. -E. And when both of the alleles for a trait, such as hair color, are the same, a person is said to be homo homozygous for that trait. When the alleles for a trait are different, the person is heterozygous for that trait. And then some traits result from an averaging of the genetic instructions carried by the parents. And so when the effects of both alleles are shown that so and they have different traits that they would be manifesting, they're said to be an incomplete dominance or a co-dominance. And so what we have here are dominant traits and recessive traits. So if you were to receive, for instance, a um, an allele for dark hair from one parent and blonde hair from another, you, most likely you would be uh, have dark hair. Um, same thing, dark hair is dominant over red hair. Or if we go down here to um, uh, dimples near the bottom, um, if one parent has the uh, genes for dimples and the other one doesn't, you probably will have dimples. That's dominant. Um, and so you see, on the other hand, most of these are pretty common. What's interesting is that normal color vision is dominant, and uh, normal vision is dominant over nearsightedness, but farsightedness is dominant over normal vision. And so these are some things to be aware of. Okay, a really big topic is chromosomal disorders. So uh, chromosomal abnormalities can cause really a wide range of health problems. Now, some of them reflect abnormalities and the first 22 pairs of autosomes. So Down syndrome is when you have an extra chromosome on the 23rd pair. So it's sometimes called trisomy uh, for three chromosomes, trisomy 21. Uh, others, reflect about, others reflect abnormalities in the sex chromosomes. So for instance, you could have an X, a Y, and a Y. Um, now, people typically have 46 chromosomes and children with more or fewer, there's also, you can have just a single X chromosome, single X um, usually experience health problems or some behavioral abnormalities. And the risk of chromosomal abnormalities uh, tends to rise along with the age of the biological parents. So there's something to keep in mind. Now, genetic disorders, um, we have a very famous one. This is Queen Victoria here, and uh, she had hemophilia, and so her blood wouldn't clot, and you could bleed a lot. Um, she transmitted the blood disorder, and it, be, it actually spread throughout a number of uh, families in European nobility, meaning it became the noble disease. That's what it says here, the royal disease. Now, some genetic abnormalities like cystic fibrosis are caused by a single pair of genes. Others are caused by a combination of genes. Now, I'm just going to give you a short list here. Some genetic abnormalities include uh, phenylketonuria, which is also known as PKU. Uh, which has to do with the ability to process uh, amino acids, Huntington's disease, sickle cell anemia, Tay-Sachs disease, cystic fibrosis, hemophilia, and muscular dystrophy. Now, I'm not going to say anything about these, except if you're taking the test, you probably want to look up each one of these and see exactly what they are and how they're passed along. Um, it is something important to consider if you're going to have a baby that these things are always a risk. Some of them are more of a risk than others, and some of them vary from one uh, racial or ethnic group uh, or another. Some of them are more likely for one gender or another, but there is always a risk in uh, conception. So that gets us to the next topic, which is about genetic counseling and prenatal testing. And um, these are ways of testing for chromosomal or genetic abnormalities. And now it's not going to be able to test for other kinds of physical ones because what you hear is you're, you're really just getting the chromosomes. Um, so a genetic counselor, that's a person who can get information about the, the couple's genetic heritage. So they get information from the parents. And then they look at whether they have any uh, risk for genetic abnormalities in the child that they might conceive. Now, there are several different procedures you can use here. Um, you want to find out whether the embryo or the fetus has these abnormalities. One is amniocentesis, and that's where you use a syringe uh, to get fluid out of the amniotic sac. Um, so uh, another one called chorionic villus sampling, or CVS, uh, you use a syringe to get some their thread-like uh, projections from the outer membrane that uh, envelop the amniotic sac and the fetus. And here you see, for instance, sticking a big needle through the abdomen and uh, through the uh, 
into the womb, there's the baby. Fortunately, the baby's not right there where the needle's coming in. You would use an ultrasound to see where they are. Um, and getting some uh, fluid out of there, then you run it into cell culture and, and um, run it through a centrifuge and you can find out what you're dealing with. Um, so you have amniocentesis where you get some fluid. You have chorionic villus sampling, CVS, where you can get some uh, uh, not just fluid but also some other material. Um, now, the thing to know is that these procedures are invasive. You're sticking a big needle through the abdomen into the womb, and each of them brings with it a risk of damage to the fetus, uh, including you know, really the most horrible one, which is a spontaneous miscarriage. And so, um, and in fact, the risk is greatest with the uh, CVS, the chorionic villus sampling. And so, you usually only want to do these things in unusual situations, you know, exercise, caution, and care. Um, on the other hand, you can also do an ultrasound. Um, an ultrasound, uh, these are the sound waves that are reflected by the fetus, and just uh, it's like a wand that, that goes over the abdomen. And the computer uses the information to get what's called a sonogram uh, of the fetus. And with the ultrasound, you can usually tell the gender of the child, usually. Um, and you can actually detect a number of physical abnormalities, for instance, by looking for space between the skull and the brain or counting the number of fingers. And, uh, and this is generally the safest method for testing because it, it, it stays entirely outside of the body. Um, also, parental blood tests can reveal a number of genetic disorders like sickle cell anemia or Tay-Sachs disease or cystic fibrosis. And, and what you have here is you do something called an alpha thetoprotein assay. And that's used to detect neural tube defects, such as spinal bifida and other chromosomal abnormalities. And so it can be very helpful to get this information because then it allows you to prepare um, for what's coming. Okay, now let's take a quick look at kinship studies. Um, we talked a moment ago about dominant and recessive traits. And so what you have here is a mother who has brown eyes because she has uh, two uh, genes for brown eyes. The father has blue eyes because he has both of the recessive traits. And their child here has one of each, but because brown eyes are dominant over blue, they, they manifest um, brown eyes. But what you have here is the difference between what's called the genotype and the phenotype. The genotype is the set of traits that you actually inherit. So this child here has the brown and blue combined genotype. On the other hand, the actual set of traits that you exhibit, those are called your phenotype. And so, for instance, the child here has the same phenotype as the mother, both brown eyes, but has a different genotype. And in fact, the child's genotype is different from either one of the parents. Um, and that actually works into a number of things where you may not necessarily know what's going on by looking because you can have many different genotypes, many different genetic uh, sets that produce the same observable trait or phenotype. Okay, just one last thing we're going to talk about in this particular movie is about uh, kinship studies with twins. And so you can have what are called twin studies and adoption studies. And these are one way of looking at the effects of nature and nurture. So, for instance, if you take monozygotic MZ, monozygotic twins, and they share 100% of their genes, and dizygotic or fraternal twins only share 50%, that, like any other uh, set of siblings. And then what you find is that if you get information uh, from a bunch of uh, identical twins and fraternal twins, monozygotic and dizygotic, you can see that the, the monozygotic twins tend to resemble each other more closely than the dizygotic fraternal twins on a number of uh, physical, psychological traits, even when the identical twins are reared apart, it means they're raised by separate families. And, and this is really one of the... Um, most powerful arguments for the influence of heredity in a lot of these uh, physical and psychological traits. Um, the flip side of this is an adoption study, and this is when uh, children are separated from their biological parents at an early age, and then what you have is that those children can be reared by adoptive parents, um, and then uh, you can see if the children tend to resemble their biological parents or their adoptive parents. And so, for instance, uh, there are certain characteristics, uh, not just physical ones, but psychological ones, where the uh, adopted child is going to resemble their 
biological parents. And again, that's more of an argument for a genetic role in that trait. On the other hand, if the adopted child tends to resemble their adoptive parents more, then that talks more about the nurture or environmental aspect. And that's where we're going to finish this one. We're going to pick up with prenatal development in the next movie.